Um, we have Denise Barstow Mains. Um, she is with Barstow's Longview Farm and Dairy Store, where, is she, where she's the marketing and education manager after getting a degree in recreation management and policy from the University of New Hampshire. Um, she's going to talk about you know what climate change means on the farm and what a farm can do. We have Patty Gambarini, a principal environmental planner with the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, and she has a master's in landscape architecture and will talk about both the role of planning but also how we deal with some of these water issues that um, you just heard about. So we have right here Josh Shanley, who is the assistant emergency management coordinator in Northampton and also the founder and principal of Mass Ready a comprehensive emergency management consulting firm serving the needs of public safety departments, public health officials, healthcare facilities, schools, businesses, and industry in Massachusetts and around New England. We have Brian Adams on the far end of the table is one of the two owners and managers of Fip and Adams Solar, which works in a really generous and creative way with nonprofits and solar panel providers to help install as much solar energy as possible. And I hope you will also talk a little bit about your first ever Clive Fi novel. Um, <laughs> so he is also an author. And then we have Tony um, next to Patty there, Tony Morello, Morelli, whose name some of you may have seen or actually have in your backyards. She is running for the school committee. Uh, Tony is a research ecologist with the U.S. Geological Survey and the Northeast Climate Adaptation Science Center at UMass Amherst, where she uses field studies, ecological modeling, and genetics to help resource managers conserve species in the face of climate and land use change. So, um, I'll just simply, um, you know, stop with my introduction and turn it over to you. I don't know, Brian, would you start us out with talking a little bit about the front end of the problem and what, you, what we can do with more solar? Uh, sure. Is it am I on? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for organizing this event. Happen to have it the nicest day of the year. <laughs> so why are you inside? <laughs> why are you listening? <laughs> Out in the um, So I'd like to uh, begin by talking a little bit about the low hanging fruit. Uh, I think, as we all know, residential and commercial buildings account for something around forty percent of all United States energy consumption. So when we're talk about climate change, we've got to talk about buildings. We're not talking about new buildings here. There's only so many new buildings that there will be in habit, right? It's all the action is in what can we do with existing buildings, with existing residences, with existing farms, with existing businesses. And I think we all know this is a no-brainer. The most important fuel for the future is no fuel, is energy efficiency. The cheapest energy we can use is the energy that we don't use. And this is the way that we reduce carbon emissions, by looking at our homes, our businesses, our farms, and how can we reduce energy use there. There are so many buildings that people live in that are just so leaky out there. It's uncomfortable, it's unhealthy, it's unsafe, it's expensive, and of course the impacts on climate change are profound. So what can we do? The first thing is to get energy audits on every single house, business, farm, in Hadley. And Mass Save does this, no matter what you think about utilities, at least they provide this free upfront service, uh, phone call away, go to the website, Mass Save, where they will come, they will do an energy audit, whether it's your home or business or whatever. It's free to come up with really good suggestions and a lot of great financial incentives. They'll do some of the work right there. I mean, this is the one thing that people can do. If the seniors sitting here take brochures out every time someone comes in, have you had an ass save audit? Uh, at the library, when people come in, have you had an ass save audit at the dump when people are recycling? Have you had an ass save energy audit? Get that word out there. Again, it's free of charge. You get all sorts of really great incentives. Um, it's not just for owners, but renters can do this as well, uh, get their landlords on, on, on board. So this is, this is really important. So low-income people, you know, how can we make uh, some of these efforts really impactful is by dealing with income disparity and, and social justice issues. So uh, there's an organization out there, a lot of you are familiar with it, which is Pioneer Valley Community Action. 
They have a weatherization program, they have a fuel assistance program too, but the weatherization is where it's at. And low income people, whether they're owners or whether they're renters, and a lot of seniors fit in this category, uh, can contact Community Action of Pioneer Valley. They'll come out there doing an NGO. They have weatherization teams out there that can come in and you know, do the work. And some of these are really pretty simple changes. I mean, looking at windows, looking at doors, looking at weather strips. Some is put another 10 inches of cellulose. You know, solar sexy, cellulose. Ooh, that's a turn off. Um, blowing another 10 inches of cellulose in the attic, getting that R down, R, resistance to heat flow. And that's where it is at. Uh, the more insulation, to a certain extent, the better. And again, a lot of cases, this is not that expensive stuff to do. And particularly to get mass safety involved, there, there, are, there are incentives to do that. Um, of course, people should have done this, but a lot of people have replacing all of those you know, heat producing light bulbs with energy efficient LED bulbs. Um, and that's, again, sort of a no brainer. One of our panel was talking about uh, this isn't rocket science, you know, putting up, putting up decent light bulbs. I want to read you one thing. It's one of my favorite um, Gazette uh, articles ever. This was a number of years ago. Um, and uh, this is what it said. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, police issued a verbal warning to an Amherst man who was unscrewing porch light bulbs in his neighborhood. A resident set up a video camera and nabbed it in the attic. Here's the quote. Police say, that when questioned, the man admitted to unscrewing porch lights and stated that he did not want to see electricity wasted. He claimed no other motives other than electric conservation, according to police. So, you know, that's what I advocate that, sneaking in to your neighbor's porches and maybe not just unscrewing them, but replacing them with an LED. A little gorilla lighting action there. Once houses are as tight as they can be, the last thing you want is combustion devices in, in your house, whether it's uh, stoves, whether it's heating systems. I mean, that's horrible for your air quality and they're not rural resources. So how can uh, we move away from burning fossil fuels? And one is to electrify. Electric stoves, they have now uh, induction stoves. I don't know if people have heard about them. Expensive, but really super efficient. They have over at uh, Manny's right down the street here. Bulk buying for induction stoves is going to be a, a, a way to do that in town. Uh, one of the speakers already talked about air source heat pumps. And these things are amazing. You can heat and cool your house with electricity. And, and, uh, and it's not that expensive. Again, there are incentives, programs to reduce the cost of that bulk buying heat pumps. Once you do that, and once you uh, make sure that you do that, then you move on to solar. And, and you know, there's a lot of creative ways to get full of takes out there. A lot of controversy about large scale arrays, but no controversy about rooftop full of takes, right? I mean, all of these south facing roofs out there on homes, on businesses, my goodness, look at the malls out here. I mean, all this flat roof day for solar. And the payback is there. The efficiency has gone up. The price has gone down. The last 10 years, the solar's price has fallen by 80%. or something crazy like that. Uh, so again, the payback period, uh, somewhere around seven years. If you don't have the money, you can rent your roof. You can have, you know, switch your utility company to a solar company. They'll put solar in your roof for free. Then you pay the money. Uh, to, um, Brian, can I interrupt you and just maybe Wrap it up in one more minute. So I want to have short introductory what? remarks and then open it to questions. Other people are going to speak. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, believe it or not, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so anyway, all right, I'll wrap it up right now. Buildings account for forty percent of the energy. We want to deal with climate change. We got to deal with the buildings. New buildings, great. Make them super efficient. Make them all electric. But it's the old buildings where the action is. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Denise, would you go next? Sure. All right. Hi, I'm Denise Barstow. I'm from Barstow's Longview Farm in Hockenau. Um, I'm part of the seventh generation, so my family's been farming in Elliott for 216 years. 
And our motto is looking forward since 1806. So that's a reminder to ourselves every day of our commitment to our herd, to our land, to our food system, and to our community. Um, we have 600 head, we milk 300 cows. Um, and all of our milk goes to the Cabot Agrimark Cooperative in West Springfield for processing mostly into Cabot butter, um, but also a variety of other um, products and brands, whatever needs you made that day. Um, I think a lot of times people don't realize that when farmers are selling wholesale, it's ending up um, right here in the, in the local community. Um, so agriculture contributes to about 11% of emissions in the country. And dairy, which includes um, on-farm transportation and dairy processing, contributes to just over 2% of nationwide emissions. Um, I'm very proud of the way that my family takes care of our herd and our land, um, and the efforts that we contribute to producing our carbon footprint. Um, so climate change is already impacting our business as we see wetter years and hotter months. Um, I was really glad to see your presentation um, about heat stress on animals. Um, that is at the forefront of our minds always. Um, and it's been in our actions as well. Um, so one important thing uh, that we do that often gets unnoticed um, is, from an emission standpoint, is animal care. Um, well cared for cows require less veterinary attention and drugs. Um, they live longer, they produce more milk, they produce higher quality milk, um, and when they're provided with consistent high quality feed, um, they produce fewer belly gas bubbles and belches. Um, so healthy cows produce less methane. Um, healthy cows also cost us less money. So whether you're looking at it at a bottom line perspective or emissions produced, animal care matters to every dairy farmer. Um, Barso Zombie Farm is also committed to being good stewards of our land. Uh, all the forage, or the cow food, um, that we raise for our animals, we grow ourselves on 450 acres of wide open Massachusetts farmland. Um, much of it is protected under the APR program, the Agricultural Preservation Restriction. Um, we, in 2014, conserved 123 of our acres under APR. Uh, our business keeps that land open and healthy, which is good for wildlife habitat, it's good for groundwater, it's good for climate resilience, and for food security in the Pioneer Valley. Um, we also rotate our crops uh, every four to six years. We use a cover crop in the winter to keep all of our topsoil in place as it gets windy. Um, we maintain a riparian buffer along all waterways, including, importantly, the Connecticut River. Um, and we also use 100% no-till practices. Um, so that's something that we 100% transitioned to in 2019. Um, it took about four years because there's a bit of a yield drag, so you don't want to do it all at once. And the equipment is super expensive. Um, but tillage is an age-old practice of turning the soil in the springtime. Um, it makes it very easy to plant, um, but it also disrupts the soil ecosystem underground, so it turn, turns up all that good fungi and bugs. Um, so no-till uses a blade to drop the seed at a measured distance into the ground and covers it up behind, um, so the ground and that big ecosystem of good soil resonance underneath is hardly disrupted. Uh, No-till practices reduce runoff and erosion, uh, it reduces labor and fuel usage. It minimizes soil compaction because we're driving over it fewer times and we're not using big blades that create a low compaction. Um, and it sequesters carbon from the atmosphere into the ground. So more living things underfoot makes for a more efficient carbon sink. Um, and the last thing I want to highlight on our farm is our anaerobic digester. It's a system that takes the uh, energy potential, or methane, out of cow manure and food waste and turns it into enough electricity to power 1,600 homes. Um, we're diverting tons and tons of local food waste from landfills annually, and we're turning it into green electricity. Um, from the system, we're also capturing heat, which we use to heat the system itself. Um, all the water that we use for cleaning in the barns and eight homes entirely, so after a long day in the barn, we'll have free hot showers. Um, and we also have a chemical-free fertilizer that we are able to spread on our land. Um, and since the installation of the digester in 2014, um, and the usage of this fertilizer, we have seen increased crop yields, um, so more, more food per acre. We have seen increased soil health, and we've decreased our chemical fertilizer usage by 90%. And this is why we invited her. Yeah. No. Okay. 
I'll try to speak more loudly. Is that better? Okay. Uh, my name is Patty Gambrini. I'm with the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, and my agency service uh, is works with the 43 um, cities and towns in Hampshire and Hamden counties. And while a lot of our work is regional, in truth, we also work at the local um, level and statewide level. And so I want to walk you through um, uh, some of the work that we do at those different scales and also leave you with sort of a, a simple action at the end of what I'm talking about. And the area I'm going to focus on is stormwater management. Um, we are working toward developing the same kind of scaled work uh, related to drinking water, but we're not there yet. And I also want to acknowledge that when I talk about stormwater, drinking water, or even wastewater, that that's kind of reductionist. That we all know we have one water. Everything we you know have on this planet relates to one source of water. And so the professional um, sort of environment I inhabit has these silos, but I think culturally we need to start thinking about how do we really understand how stormwater becomes drinking water, how you know all of, some of it becomes wastewater, like it's all connected. But so I'm going to talk about stormwater management at the regional scale. Um, I think one of the most powerful things we do is we convene and facilitate um, what many would call a community of practice. And this is professionals who are working to really better understand how to meet regulatory requirements and how to advance um, climate resiliency related to stormwater management. The group started in 2007 and has grown now to 19 municipalities um, and UMass Amherst. And we convene twice, you know, regularly through the year, um, every other month. And I think while we're while we're the core of our work is uh, regulatory compliance with some of the federal stormwater permit. Uh, a, another growing piece of our work is really talking about how we improve what we're doing across um, our landscapes. So this year, for example, we had a grant from Mass EP. We did a training on um, what is referred to as green infrastructure stormwater management. And that's trying to move toward thinking about places where we can create these softscapes, um, mimicking nature to receive stormwater, slow flows, absorb it, rather than that pipe and outlet to streams model that we have used for so long to get stormwater away. Because that's creating you know, issues at culverts or failures. Carolyn just shared with me a little bit about that in Hadley. Um, you know, it creates all sorts of problems, um, that old management practice. So we did a training as part of the grant for um, municipal officials throughout the region. It was a multi-day training. The level of conversation now is very different. People are thinking and talking differently about how to tackle issues. Uh, and the other companion piece to that is we have a great engineer working with us to create a library of design templates for these facilities so that municipal officials who are doing roadway projects or private developers doing projects will be able to pull from a shelf and know how to size it, um, upscale it or downscale it, know what the expected costs are, and um, the maintenance requirements. So um, I feel like that's all really hopeful. At the local level, we try to take um, you know, what is emerging know-how and turn that into action with community partners. So Susie mentioned the Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness Program. It's a tremendous opportunity to get funds locally to really move some of this adaptation capacity forward. So in one town, we partnered with a um, consulting engineer who looked at stormwater infrastructure throughout the town, identified vulnerabilities, prioritized um, resiliency actions that the town could take, uh, a colleague and I, in my agency, we went through um, development standards and redevelopment standards in the town and described how they could be fine-tuned to produce less impervious cover, that's hard surface, um, and better manage stormwater so that you have um, projects in the end that are more resilient. And then the, my favorite part of the project was work done by two nonprofit organizations, an environmental organization 
um, and an arts organization that did uh, residency in the schools um, over eight days, uh, arts integration with all the fifth graders learning about stormwater and then producing these wonderful drawings um, that are now hanging as public art throughout the town. And then, so all that work at the regional, local um, scale enables us to really have these productive conversations at the state level. And I gather regularly with other stormwater coalitions, um, because that's now a thing, regional stormwater coalitions, to really figure out how to, how to do better. Um, and so we meet regularly with them. We have uh, done some statewide projects, Eastern Mass, Western Mass, um, that creates a powerful bridge, I think, and um, builds know-how even further and creates state models. Um, so those are the three scales that we typically work at. Um, and I want to give you a stormwater-related action that you can think about. In the next heavy rainfall that we have, you know, Susie mentioned those downpours are more frequent. When there's not lightning, but when there's a downpour, go out around your home, your business, and start to look at those pathways for water. Where's the water going? Is it going down your roof, down spout off the roof, down the driveway into the street and into a catch basin? Is it going into a ditch that's eroding into a stream? And if it is, start to look at those places where you might create spaces to slow flow, to absorb flow, and there's some great tools out there. Um, the University of Connecticut has a rain garden app. It's fantastic. It can take you from sort of sizing the area you want um, to picking plants to put in the rain garden. Um, there's also Soak Up the Rain. EPA has a great website on that. And then we also have a companion website for the Pioneer Valley that has examples of Soak Up the Rain in the Pioneer Valley. So thank you very much, and um, thank you, Susie. Thank you. Well, I'm thinking Josh might be a good next person, so if there is too much water and we can't get it down into the ground fast enough, then we will call on you. So Josh, take it from here. Thanks, Susie. Thank you for having me. Um, my name is Josh Shanley, and Susie went into the Wayback Machine for my bio, um, apparently. <laughs> So uh, I was born and raised in New York City, uh, Brooklyn and Greenwich Village. And then in 1997, I came to uh, finish my undergrad at UMass. And I got my bio, uh, biology degree and, and stayed. I, I worked for Amherst Fire for 12 years. I jumped ship across the river to Northampton where I uh, spent 13 years. Um, and I just retired in uh, well, November of last year. <laughs> so. Um, in both communities, Amherst and Northampton, I served as the emergency management director. Uh, so I looked outwardly at these issues in terms of preparedness and re response and recovery. And now that I'm getting older, after 32 years of uh, being out in the, in the street, um, I'm looking for ways to offset damage so I don't have to get up in the middle that I can deal with these issues, frankly. <laughs> so when we look at these kinds of issues that we're talking about, and here in Hadley, I'm going to pick up on the things that Susie set up for me and, and Julie set up, um, where getting these regional issues and Patty started to queue up and really get hyper local, like down to like West Street. And, and Susie mentioned the dike on along the Connecticut River. Those are the issues that um, if I was here, if I was still in this um, uh, role, I, that would keep me up at night. I met with uh, Chief Spangabell the other day. Uh, I was going to look at the dike before so I could really have uh, eyes on it and speak accurately. And he was out with the uh, DOT looking at drainage issues. Um, so um, what I'm going to talk about during my session later on is the history of flooding and the importance of looking back. Um, the tagline I use is what's past is prologue. Um, Julie mentioned that 15,000 years ago, we were at the bottom of a one mile deep um, ice glacier that suddenly broke or melted and then somewhere around Rocky Hill, Connecticut, the dam opened up and here we are now. Um, so when we talk about these issues, it's, it's adaptation versus mitigation. And I am all about uh, mitigation and offsetting greenhouse gases, but that is, a 
that's what the majority of you are bringing to this, this issue. I'm not opposed to it, um, but that's just, I don't have cows. Um, so I'm not looking to offset my greenhouse gas uh, off of both brand. Okay. Right. So I'm all about that. I appreciate the work Denise is doing. But at the bottom of your driveway, if I'm not mistaken, you have a um, uh, flood marker, right? Mm -hmm. That shows how high the water was at, at uh, any one point. I believe the top of that pole is 1936. So there were other hurricanes, uh, Hurricane 38, a big flood in 27. I would love, I bet your family has boxes of photos. I'd love to go um, pour over them at some point. My point is that um, the work that uh, is it, uh, pertaining to uh, the mitigation side, offsetting these greenhouse gases is, is critical. But my job is to be the professional pessimist in the room. And what happens when these systems fail? What happens when we don't offset those greenhouse gases and that hockey stick does not stop? That's my job and that's what keeps me up in that. So those are the things that I'm going to be talking about later. That's what I do all day, every day. So, sorry to be such a downer. That's part of the game. That's, that's why we invited you too. <laughs> Thank you. Tony, I'm going to bring up the slide you wanted, and you can start okay. your remarks. Thanks. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Tony Lynn Morelli. Uh, first, thanks to Jane and Susie and Jack and the rest of the Hadley Climate Change Committee for putting on this great event and for all of you to, for being here. Um, I work at the Northeast Climate Adaptation Science Center which is a partnership between the U.S. Geological Survey and a consortium of Northeastern universities hosted right here in Hadley at UMass. Um, part of UMass is in Hadley, so I'm starting a movement to call it UMass Hadley. Um, <laughs> Jane Marks here. Um, I'm also adjunct faculty in environmental conservation at UMass Hadley. I've lived in Hadley for about 10 years, and I've learned to greatly appreciate how much people love the winter. So it's really hard to see the science say over and over again that we're uh, losing our winters in New England due to climate change. This means having fewer and fewer good ski and pond skating days as snow falls less and melts faster. Um, Something that makes me very sad when I think about uh, the picture you'll see in just a second of my Sorry. son playing in Technology the failure. Uh, of course, all of this, of course, this also has negative impacts on ecosystems and, um, but also on operations and livelihoods uh, in terms of both recreation and just uh, actions that need uh, hard uh, frozen ground to happen in the winter. As a wildlife ecology, ecologist, I also worry about the impacts of the loss of snow in winter on uh, our regional wildlife. We live in an area that's just at the southern edge of a vast eco-region that stretches all the way up to Alaska for some of these species. The paper birch and the moose and the red squirrels and black hole warblers that live here at the southern extent, the southern cousins of these faraway trees and mammals and birds. They're important because they represent unique biodiversity in our region, but they're also important because they can potentially hold some genetic keys to supporting those individuals and populations north of us as they've ex already experienced south more southerly, more warm, more uh, low snow winters than those other species. And they are in trouble. Carolyn mentioned the decimation of wildlife. You might have seen the three billion birds loss in the last 50 years in North America. You may have heard that moose calves are being wiped out in New Hampshire by winter ticks as climate changes. Winter ticks swell up to the size of quarters and can have, uh, uh, moose can have up to 80,000 of them on them. So they can just drain an animal of blood over winter. Thank you, I see it. I see everyone seeing it. 
Our state bird, the black-capped chickadee, is on the list of birds we're likely to lose from Massachusetts by 2050. A study that I did with some colleagues on maple syrup, something of import to our town and region, um, is showing that it will be harder and harder to come by as our sugar maple trees uh, lose their health and distribution and actually produce sap that is less sweet with climate change. In Saving Us, climate scientist even an evangelical Christian, Dr. Catherine Hayhoe, mentions the work that Professor Bethany Bradley at UMass Hadley and I are doing uh, on invasives in climate change. Uh, many of you have, may have experienced the frustration in trying to keep out oriental bitter, bittersweet or garlic mustard or Japanese knotweed out of your yard. Unfortunately, it's going to get worse. We're, as we get wetter and warmer in Hadley and in the Northeast, we get much more friendly for uh, the non-native invasives that are either coming up from the south or um, continuously coming in from other countries. And also all of those extreme storms you've heard about are just opening up more uh, disturbances in the forests and other places to allow for those invasives to take root. Um, you might have heard about kudzu, so if we think oriental bittersweet is bad, the vine that ate the south is on its way. Um, and of course these bigger storms, uh, wetter times, more intense invasives are not only problems for our natural systems, but also for agriculture and for our hoofstock. Uh, heavy farmers will be the first ones to tell you, thanks to access to irrigation, that heavy rains are um, bigger problems than drought here for most people, leaving plants rotting in the fields and tobacco leaves rotting in the barns. And as Julie told us, we'll be experiencing more and more of both heavy rains and intermittent droughts. But there are certainly things we can do for our wildlife and ecosystems, just as when you're more susceptible to being sick when you're overly stressed at work or home, organisms have a harder time combating the impacts of climate change when they're stressed. So consider planting natives in your backyard instead of invasive so that your local plants don't have to deal with hotter temperatures and stiffer competition. Consider good soil practices that we heard about, mowing less, using fewer pesticides, as we do on the Mosquito Opt-Out Committee, um, we're helping the town to do Bobby's back there at the table. You can visit her and the work we're doing. Plant local flowers. There's an awesome um, picture out front showing how many dozens of bees we have in our backyard. Um, you can help support those and the butterflies. Help them have a stand a chance against climate change. Um, consider how fast you drive down my... Rocky Hill Road <laughs> and watch out for crossing, crossing wildlife. I bike my commute and every day I see dead small mammals and sometimes larger mammals because people don't do 30 miles or less. Um, it's kind of a death trap. Um, and of course, keep reducing your footprint. Eat locally, compost, bike, take public transit or carpool whenever possible. Mini splits, ground um, water heat pumps, solar panels, Pellet stoves. In Saving Us, many copies available at the library, Dr. Hayhoe tells us there is something else we can do about climate change. One of the things she stresses is talking to your friends, families, neighbors about climate change, like we're doing here today. Tell them about how our Sunday syrup, their backyard garden, your cross-country ski, your child or grandchild's snow fun is in danger. And then talk about what you can do about it so that our Hadley kids can have this much fun for future generations. Thank you. So we have a little bit more time before our lunch break um, to have questions. Can I just have a show of hands how many questions are in the room, just so we have a, a sense? A couple questions around. So let's just start with those three, and then um, we'll go um, to a couple questions that I have. So let's start there and speak up really loudly since you don't have a microphone. <laughs> um, 
just I was remembering earlier about the mass wanting to be a model because of geothermal. Just the thoughts that it's almost implicit what you're all saying, but could we think of our bioregion as the whole valley as a model? We just think maybe we start to coordinate that way. That's one thought. And I just saw the front line that's just come out about how long big oil and how much they've lied in the last four years. We're just wondering if uh, we can, you know, these local things that we're doing, boycotting oil, of course, is out there. How can we like, start doing that from a local place? Um, you know, like any candidate that gets any fossil fuel money to make that a single issue of how you don't support them. I just think boycotts are very important too. I'm just so filled with rage watching that, and I, I recommend it. Because even though we know they did it, to see how they did it, I don't know, just give you some, something to know about. What the so two two different things. Where do we find that? Yeah, on PBS. Brian, do you want to? What's it called? Frontline, the power of the world. It's three parts. Brian, do you want to take that on for electrification, or else I'm going to call on Ted? Call on Ted. Okay. Do you want to join us for this conversation uh, sure. and, and maybe respond to this call for getting away from oil? All right. So the so the question is, how do we how do we electrify? Essentially, okay. essentially, get, get away from oil. Right. How do we we think of our whole valley as a model for the world? Wow, that's quite a question. Um, so, you know, let me answer it this way. Um, each of us has a, has a puzzle to solve, right? So, you know, I can think of the recent choice that I made, that my family made recently, when one of our old breaking down cars needed to be replaced. And we said, well, you know, what are we going to do? You know, we have, I have uh, a 13 and a 15 year old. So we know they're gonna wanna drive. We know we're gonna need something that they're gonna bang around on, you know. And we didn't wanna get a nice shiny new car necessarily, but we were kind of balancing the thought of, you know, gas and using it and having it for the next 10 years or so. And, you know, looked at what was available and saw that there were as opposed to maybe five years ago, a lot more choices in electric cars. And tried to find ways to do it in an affordable way. So we ended up purchasing once, right outside actually. It's a nice car, um, you know, it was a little more expensive, but again, we were able to find incentives to kind of help, you know, temper it for us, right? That's a small decision that we made. And now I haven't seen a gas station for like six months, right? Which is pretty cool. I mean, realizing that for a lot of the stuff that, that we do on a daily basis, it's really within the, you know, a 10 to 15 mile radius of us. So what does that mean to me, right? It means that if we have a car like that, that makes a difference, right? If we have, you know, if we have bikes and, you know, if maybe, you know, I'm a bit lazy or tired, if we had an electric bike, you know, that might make a difference. So. Um, you know, thinking of it as a model for, you know, us as a model for the region, right? The things that we can do, it, it kind of starts with, what's that puzzle for you, right? What is it in your, in your household, in, in the way that you live life, in the stuff that you can afford, that you can start making those little, little differences? I mean, UMass is making a big leap, right? And it's going to cost a lot of money. And we know that money is coming, is gonna come from somewhere, not just one place, but probably many places. And there's gonna be connections, um, you know, mutually beneficial partnerships and connections that people make emotionally to um, that decision that they make. And it's, it's kind of the same for us, right? I mean, we're, we can do it on our own, but then as we start seeing that other people are doing similar things, then you start building that community and that dialogue. And then you can start thinking about bigger things. Right, and so that's kind of that's like with uh, what I was presenting earlier. That's kind of what I wanted to say is that you know let's just plant this seed to start thinking about what those bigger things you know are, and how this area can transform into something that other areas can look at and say, that's a pretty cool idea. I think we should start thinking about how we're going to do that. 
you know, so thinking about that is, um, I, th I guess, the stepping stone to answer your question. You know, it's it's really these incremental steps and thinking about the big picture all, all along the way. Thank you. Thanks. Can I just add? Yes, go ahead. Because um, I went through that very similar decision making process, and I think one of the things, you know, while we need to get away from fossil fuels, we also want to make sure that the manufacturers of electric cars are not sourcing materials and destroying other places on the planet. So the more we can advocate for where's the lithium coming, where's the copper coming from, and you know, recycling using what we already have in a lot of you know our, our current instruments or tools, um, that, that we're sort of checking all the boxes. And thinking far beyond that, and maybe a little faster even than, than incremental. I see one question there, there, and one in the back. So. Uh, this is for Denise. I happen to live in one of those eight homes on the Barstow farm that gets free heat from the cows, so thank you. Um, given the very rosy economic picture you painted, are you reaching out to other farmers and saying, hey, this is a, a relatively easy thing you can do with a fast payback, and how is it being received? Thank you. Yeah, so the anaerobic digester is what we talked about specifically. Um, so the, the numbers show that we're still getting most of our money from milk. Um, the most important thing that we do on the farm is take care of the cows and make the milk. 85% of our income is still from, from dairy. Um, and I think that's one of the hardest economic issues with being a dairy farm is that the only way for farmers to make more money is to make more milk. So we have an oversupply issue and that's like a whole other thing. Um, but we work with Vanguard Renewables um, so that we can focus on farming and getting our crops in at the right time and all that. And they can focus on um, the maintenance and the chemistry and the food waste contracts that are coming in with, um, with the food. Um, and they can focus on keeping that running. Um, so they certainly do a lot of outreach. Um, and it's not the perfect fit for every farm. You need a lot of land because you need to be able to spread that food waste and how manure after it's been through that digester process. Um, some farms, they don't have that much land. They end up buying their feed in. The fact that we grow all of our own forests is important to why it works for us. I was actually talking more about the economics of the no till. Oh, the no till. Yes. Um, so there's five other dairy farms in, or there's five total dairy farms in Adley. Um, and because that equipment is so expensive, um, and because we are all a team that is making food for our community, um, our no-till hay planter and no-till corn planter go to those other farms as well. So that is something that is the benefit of having many farms in one area. Um, when you have just one farm and it's its own little island, um, that is not food secure. Having that community is what makes it. So we need to keep all the farms that we can. That's fantastic. Yes. I feel we live in a society where a lot of people are focused on their own belly button. I really think that your movement has to radicalize it. It reminds me of you know, the Black Lives Matter movement where people held signs. I think this movement needs to be become a little bit more radicalized and not I mean these forums are wonderful for people getting information. But I think as far as getting people off their butts, we need to uh, you know, I just wanna have a comment and have any feedback. Join our committee. We need more bodies because we're all professionals who, in their ample spare time, um, try to do this. So, all these wonderful intellectual things. How do we get people concerned about their community? I find it. I've lived in Halifax for 20 years. Do you want to? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
I can feel a lot better. You know, you have to leave a light on. You know, you know, you know you fight and that. You know. uh, and a, a, a sort of question to that, I don't know if I'm the only one, but I love the PowerPoint. I wonder if you can make that available to the registrant. Um, we'll have to figure out a way to do that. We are, are as you can see, recording the whole thing. So um, it is going to be available through Hadley Media, um, this entire event. So, um, But we'll figure out a way noted, shall we say. <laughs> Another question back there. Yes? Yeah, just a quick comment, uh, Brian. I think what you said is the clock is tick ticking, or the tick is clocking. Uh, <laughs> my, my comment really comes back to lithium, which is not benign. We need to understand that the sourcing of lithium has many implications. I can draw the group's attention to a video from about five years ago called Chasing Lithium by Rachel Lyles. It is, it will chill your heart. Yeah. Any other questions? Great. Then I want to just, did I miss somebody? Lenore, go for it. I'm sorry, I like Great. Well, thank you so much for being here, and now let's have lunch.